Thank you. I'm, I'm really, really honored to be here. I, I'm humbled uh, to be here, considering the folks who have preceded me here as keynotes. I, I, I'm kind of a pretender, so I, I, uh, I'm um, very glad to be here, and, and it's, a, it's a good day for Pew when I'm in front of people like you all. Um, I, it's the end of the conference, so I thank you for this amazing conference that you put together, but I also don't think that uh, maybe a, a full-blown lecture is what people need at this hour of the day at this day of the conference. So I am happy to be interrupted at any point along the way if someone wants to ask a question or if someone wants me to elaborate something that they don't understand or someone wants to challenge me. I, it's, it, at this point, let's just um, talk to each other as much as me lecturing at you. And you can maybe already tell that I'm a native New Yorker and New Yorkers speak really, really fast. So I'm, I'm particularly aware that I need to give people breaks every once in a while to understand what I'm saying. We self-describe at the Pew Research Center as a fact tank, and we do that deliberately to distinguish ourselves from another part of the Washington, D.C. political bestiary, think tanks. Think tanks are very much in the business of solving the world's problems. They are policy entrepreneurs of think tanks. They see problems, they devise solutions, they advocate for those solutions. That's not the model for the Pew Research Center. We are entirely advocacy free. Matter of fact, I'm a former journalist. I have no detectable belief system. So that's a perfect marriage of a man and a mission uh, but we are not funded to change the world. We are very much supposed to be removed as primary researchers in describing how things are going, but there's no agenda behind our work, but there's no official Pew position on net neutrality. There's no official Pew position on what should happen to ICANN. None of that stuff, you know, no technologies or anything like that. So that's the spirit with which I uh, am engaging you. We do lots of surveys. Increasingly, we're using other data to help tell stories about how technology is used in people's lives. Um, and so that's what I wanted to share with you today. I'm going to make two points. Uh, networked individuals using networked information create networked organizations and movements. That's what's going on here. That's probably why um, I was asked to talk at this conference. And networking, networking is unstoppable uh, because people will always have problems they want to solve and there are new technologies of social action that help them promote causes. So those are the last time I'll read slides. But that's just it, what I'm going to say. There are lots of issues that the rise of the internet has brought into people's lives. There are lots of problems. There are lots of ways that corporate and nation state interventions of the internet make all sorts of mischief of what, what's going on. But the sort of central thing that we see time and time again is we ask people what's going on with them and their technology use is that they like it. They think it's basically good for them, even when they add up all of the problems that it introduces to their life. And they think that it's really good for them to be social beings in the way that we are uh, humanly constituted. It just makes us more so of something that we already are. Uh, uh, Brian was great to reference the sort of grand theoretical construct of our work, which isn't my idea. Uh, the reason I affiliated with the wonderful sociologist Barry Wellman now at the University of Toronto is because he did have a sort of unified field theory about the social impact of the internet. He called it networked individualism. And it's meant to be embracing of the irony of those words. So individualism, particularly in the Western sense, is sort of a, a problem idea. It's, it's something that uh, when more people act on their own and don't necessarily connect to others, it's not necessarily a good thing, especially for, from the perspective of sociologists and other social scientists. But we had to qualify our network in front of them because in so many ways now, the data that Barry developed in Canada, that we have developed in the United States, and in some respects is reflected in some of our worldwide explorations, shows that people now are living and situate themselves inside networks. And the big idea that uh, Barry introduced to me and that then became borne out with our data is that the atomic unit of social activity has greatly shifted over recent centuries, but it has been particularly um, changing in the recent years since digital technology came into people's lives. The shift was that in the good old days, 
uh, the atomic unit of social interaction was small-scale, tight-knit communities. It's the family, it's the village, small artisan groups, really tight, really local, everybody knew everybody else's business. Now we live in networks, which are far-flung, which are not necessarily local, and which are much more loosely socially constructed. We're not living in that tight-knit village atmosphere. And the reason, one of the sort of one reasons that networking is unstoppable is in this map of us. We've come together in this group, um, and I asked my friend Mark Smith to look at the tweets that were coming out of this group, and you can see how we've become sort of a, a unit working together. We're talking to each other, we're sharing information. These are the folks who are most aggressive on Twitter, so it's just a, it's a particular format. It's yesterday. And one of the cool things about these maps is not only showing who's connected to whom and who's central to conversations and who are nodes that are driving conversations. First of all, it's a tight network. We're not necessary. We're not necessarily dispersed, at least for the purposes of this meeting. We're hanging together in really interesting ways. The other thing that this network mapping tool allows us to do is to look at the information we're sharing with each other. Not only are we talking to each other, tweeting about the really wonderful insights that have come out of the uh, panels and the keynote speeches here, but we're also linking to information. And in yesterday's, this is a map of yesterday, so it's the, not the whole conference. So what do you think was the number one shared piece of content yesterday in our map? It was the YouTube video of Under the Dome. Yeah, it was such an important insight from Professor Hu about how the Great Firewall has, had been breached in, in some respects. And it was a very moving thing to watch how people were sharing the video, in some cases uh, looking at it. But it's just, it's just another way to show that when people are together, they, they network and they share stuff, particularly with these, with these tools. Now, one of the most Interesting things that I, I'd be interested in hearing about the Asian story, but it's certainly true in the West. Networks now have become repositories of people's trust, particularly as their trust is shifting from major institutions. In lots of the work that we do, and we ask people, who do you rely on? What institutions do you care about? Do you, how do you assess the credibility of institutions? <coughs> We've seen a systematic decline in the West, particularly the United States, for every major category of institution except one. The church has gone down, the media has gone down, the political community has gone down, the corporate community has gone down, banks have plummeted since the Great Recession. Uh, the one institution that's actually had a little bit of, of an increase in its reputation is the US military. And people always, always, always love librarians, they love nurses, and they learn, love first responders in their community, usually the firefighters in their community. So those are, so it's, it's, it's the military and those three other groups that have survived this sort of crisis of confidence in major institutions that is occurring in lots of different places. So where is that trust going? You can't talk to people about that, but what is clear in their activities is that they are now depending on their networks to do some of the things that they used to depend on and their parents and grandparents used to depend on major institutions to preserve for them. So now, among other things, because we can see each other so vividly in networks and because we can construct networks sort of on the fly, um, networks are really differently composed now from the way that they used to be. In those type of communities, of course, there are lots of close ties and a few acquaintance ties. Now, our networks are dominated by acquaintances or weak ties. As a matter of fact, for a while, I've been making the argument that in addition to weak ties and strong ties, there should be an additional layer added to networks that I call the audience layer. Because there are people, uh, I'm sure this is true in your networks, you have people in your networks who don't necessarily know you but follow you. You sometimes follow people that you don't necessarily know, but you know enough about them. They're a friend of a friend. They've given a really great talk at a conference. They are wonderful um, uh, conveyors of information in social networks. So you're connected to them, even though you don't know much about them. But in a way, as you're tweeting, as you're doing Facebook, as you're performing in other social media, you are performing for that audience. So we're all sort of little mini celebrities trying to prove to our networks that we've got some value, 
that we've got some status because we hang out with cool people like each other, that we've got interesting things to share, and that you know we're worth paying attention to. So there, there, that's part of the new composition of networks. The other thing that's been true for a while, of course, is as we move to these loose-knit networks, our networks have different segments. Um, there are, in, in the old village culture, everybody knew everybody and everybody knew about you. In these looser network operations, the people who are your friends at school are different from your people who are friends in your neighborhood, who are different from the play friends that you have at work, who are different from the friends that you might have at your uh, at a, at a community organization or something like that. They don't necessarily know each other or talk to each other. So you, one of the nice things about the network world is that many people have a little bit of social liberation. They're not necessarily under the gaze of the tight-knit community all the time. They can, they can uh, engage some of their network from time to time when they need to, but they don't have to tell everybody everything, and everybody doesn't talk about them uh, in the same kinds of ways. So there's a little bit of liberation in this world, but there's a lot more work when you have social needs that you want to be met. In that tight-knit world, if you lived in that village and you were sick, couldn't make it out to the fields to plow them or you couldn't harvest your crop, your neighbors knew about it and they sort of automatically rallied to your help. So you had a nice safety net in that environment. Now, in the network world, not so much. There, there are people who know a little bit about you but don't necessarily know you might have an emotional need or a financial need or a job need or something like that. So you have to work harder to announce what your needs are and to rally your network on your behalf to give you the things that you want. So more liberation, more work. That's a, that's a, that's a reality of network life. As I say, there's more trust and influence now in networks, and I would again invite you to think about the way that you organize the media flows and the social flows of information into your life. There are, you know, in the good old days, uh, pre-internet, uh, industrial age of media, People started their days with mass media, right? That it organized the agenda of what the culture of the community was talking about. You sort of outsourced the curation of important information to the city editor at a local newspaper or the producer at a local station. But now, your friends are much more important for you to signal what information is worth paying attention to in the first place, to tell you what news is relevant to the kinds of things that you care about, and to tell you uh, it's sort of what's, what's worth paying attention to in the world. So the, the gatekeepers, in some respects, of information, the centuries of information in people's lives, are now their friends, whose Facebook feeds, and whose Twitter feeds, and whose Pinterest feeds, and whose, and whose listservs, and just the, the, the networks now are serving the function of being gatekeepers and curators of information in new ways. Um, the second thing that we see with, with network behavior, uh, in addition to being centuries of information, is that when people now are confused about things, when a new piece of information has come into their life that they're not necessarily sure how it fits into the map they have of the world in their head, they will turn to their network to evaluate the information. What does it mean? Well, is it true? Their, their networks <laughs> now are much more likely to be the places where meaning making is, 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 is starts and where you know their, their friends can help them sort of sort through things and help decide whether they need to adjust their map to this new information or whether it's an inconsequential little factoid that doesn't matter. So networks are performing new functions in people's lives and also that audience later also is sort of a, a place where people can be exhibiting their talent and their stature and their knowledge and things like that. So they, they we're, we're sort of at taking advantage of that extra new layer in our network to um, promote ourselves to that. Uh, let me stop there. Honest to goodness, I'm going to stop and see if there are any questions. Uh, is everybody still with me on network individualism, or do you think that's a silly idea? Or? Okay, you're going to let me charge through to the end and we can get out of here. Uh, in the, so all of these factors were, were sort of driven by big social and political changes that preceded the internet. This isn't a brand new thing that's happening. Um, you know, there, there are uh, transportation patterns that matter. There are job status patterns. The changing nature of families is a big part of the story about how network individualism is a reality of life now, particularly as the role of women is changing and, and you know, marriage itself is, uh, is, is changing. So, um, the, the, 
three revolutions that we talk about in the book are, are sort of additive of things that were already underway, but they put them on hyperdrive. They really change in, in, a, in a very speeded up format the, uh, these moves towards network uh, individuals. Uh, so three, we, we've, just in the 15 years that we've been doing uh, technology research, we've watched three revolutions unfold. You know, most social scientists don't get to see one revolution in their lifetime. We're just waiting for the next one to occur. It's really a, a, a wonderful feast to be paying attention to. Uh, the first one, of course, is internet broadband itself. Uh, these are American data, so uh, about 87% or 89% now of Americans have, uh, have the internet um, in their lives, and 70% have broadband at home. It changed the way that information flowed into their life, it changed the way that they thought about their own agency and capturing information. It was a huge uh, change uh, from the industrial era media flows that came into their life. Uh, here's some international data, just so that everybody knows. Um, Pew, we, you know, our technology work is grounded in the United States, but we have colleagues who do global polling. And all of our data, I, 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 you know, we were, um, data sharers and open data folks before that was a cool thing to be. All of our data, all the survey data are available for download for your own analysis. We will help you with that. It's a sort of easy to use formats and things like that. And, and so these global data are also available for people to do their own analysis. We don't survey in every country, but every two years we survey in about 40 or 50 countries. And there's wonderful longitudinal data about internet adoption in, in those places. The second revolution, so first revolution is broadband. The second revolution is the mobile revolution, and it's you know, ubiquitous now. 91% of American adults, 94% uh, of American teenagers have cell phones. 64%, uh, so almost two thirds of the people in the United States have cell phones. And we're, we're just collecting new data that I haven't ever shared before. Uh, close to half now have tablet computers. And all of the sort of adoption patterns that you expect to see from the, the long-standing literature on innovation of adoption hold up here. I mean, uh, people at higher socioeconomic status are the early adopters, but now these technologies are so fully reaching the saturation point that uh, only modest segments of the population aren't, aren't necessarily using them, although, you know, there's still digital divides uh, to worry about. Um, so that's the smartphone number, that's the, I mean, that's the cell phone number, the smartphone number, and the tablet number. Uh, again, sort of we have these data um, for other cultures, and it's really interesting to see that the cell phone penetration rate and the, the relationship, the ratio of cell phones to smartphones is smaller uh, in more developing countries. It's a resource issue. Uh, but it's interesting to see um, how cultures have uh, even surpassed you know, the United States in their embrace, in many cases, of, um, of cell phones and mobile connectivity. And just some slides for those data. I'm happy to talk about um, them if you care about that. So broadband, mobile, and the third revolution is social, which is essentially putting all of this social stuff and this social networking stuff out there for people to see. Humans have been social forever, uh, but the new thing is how networks are reified and, and refined uh, in, in this environment. These are social networking data broken out by age, um, and younger folks are on the top line, but my favorite single pre statistic is that now um, close to half of senior citizens, 65 and older, are using social networking sites. And one of the absolute fun parts of my job is to watch how families try to adjust to that reality when mom wants to friend junior and junior is horrified by the prospect, which is driving up lots of use of uh, Snapchat and WhatsApp and things like that. But people, you know, um, it was interesting, Professor Hall was, was talking about the death of these platforms. Uh, what we don't see yet is any evidence that that's happening. There's lots of transition, there's lots of segmentation of people's um, communication strategies and information strategies. Actually, in America, I don't know about other places, more than half of social media users use two or more different kinds of sites. So they are segmenting which audiences they want to reach with what kind of information in a variety of ways. And sometimes it's to avoid surveillance in certain cultures or to, to, to use for different social purposes. But there's a way now that people, uh, particularly young folks, are having to make strategic calculations. Which platform do I use? Who do I want to talk to? What information do I share? How public do I want it? And, and things like that. So it's a really interesting, um, more complex environment than it, than it used to be. And again, these are our data. Um, 
about the rise of social networking sites around the world. What's so striking to me uh, about, and these are developing countries, we, we don't even have the Western data in these slides, what's so striking to me is that in many cultures, if you're an internet user, you're a social media user. It's just, it goes hand in hand, uh, much more so than in the United States. As a matter of fact, there's fabulous research that was published about three weeks ago that basically found that uh, in some cultures, people who use Facebook and Twitter don't think they're using the internet. You can ask them, are you an internet user? Do you do these things? Do you use these apps? No. Do you use Facebook? Yes. Do you use Twitter? Yes. And so they're now, we used to screen internet use questions on computer user questions. We asked you first, were you a computer user? And then we asked you, if you said yes, were you an internet user? We stopped doing that about 12 years ago, but we're now thinking that we have to ask everybody in our samples, do you use social media? Because people don't necessarily know when they're launching an app, uh, when they're, even when they're online in these um, activities that they're exploiting connectivity that's driven by the internet. So in these cultures now, uh, it's, it's sort of the killer app. Uh, for, for many uh, embracing the internet, that social media is, is just an essential part of the picture. And the, you know, one thing just to ruin all your lives at the end of this fabulous conference where your brains are bursting just like mine, the fourth revolution is on our doorstep. Um, the, the internet of things is uh, unfolding before our eyes with wearables, with self-driving cars, or cars that have lots of sensors in them, the environment being censored. What, it's just amazing, we'll come back maybe in five years and talk about what that's doing to digital culture. Because we think it's not too long from now, particularly in developed countries, that we're gonna stop asking people if they're internet users. It's gonna be so embedded in their environment and so ubiquitous in their lives that they won't be thinking, you know, it's a keyboard activity or it's a swiping activity or something like that. It's just there, kind of like electricity. And you know, the great definition of the impact of technology is it becomes its most powerful when it fades to the background of people's lives. When you don't necessarily think about it unless it's broken, that's when you think about it. And so thinking what this will do to how people share, to the kind of data streams that they not only access, but that they generate as they are marching through the censored rooms that they're in and the censored environment that they're in and the censored cars and, and public transit systems that they ride in. I mean, this, this is now a certainty that it's gonna happen. There are enormous consequences for, for social interaction, for privacy and people's own agency, for the way algorithms might sort of narrow the boundaries of people's lives, and, you know, stuff we've been talking about. But this is, this is a reality, and, um, and there's just staggering excitement about this in the business community. You know, there, you, there's an American technology analyst firm called Gartner Associates, and they have this wonderful thing called the hype cycle, uh, where they, they chart how everybody goes crazy in the early days of a technology, and it peaks and it peaks and it peaks, and then it ne inevitably doesn't work the way people originally predict. And so there's this crash of despair that the darn things are just never going to happen. And then there's finally a, a much more gradual and realistic notion about what a technology can do and how people will fit it into their lives and stuff. The Internet of Things is at the very peak of the hype cycle on the Gartner um, chart now. I think that feels about right, but I think it's, it's, there's no technologist I talk to or even technology analyst who doesn't think that this will be the reality of many of our lives um, coming soon. So all of this stuff coming together networks information. So I explained how it sort of implicates network individuals. It networks information too, which is a big part of the story about social movements and stuff. So first of all, data are now and, and media are pervasive at, on both sides of the equation. They're pervasively available and pervasively generated. People are now sort of actively contributing to the media ecosystem in ways that were unimaginable just a, you know, a decade ago. People's coping mechanisms in this environment uh, are, to, are to set up new filters, both technological filters that you know, we've made reference to, filter bubbles and echo chambers and stuff like that. Some of that is going on, at least in our data. Um, in a way, we can talk later on if you feel like it, I think a more vivid reality about um, sort of citizenship in these spaces is not sort of echo chamber, you know, people uh, balkanized. It's, it's a difference between the echo chamber of people who are at least partly engaged with civic information, news, and things like that, and empty chamber folks. Folks who just don't 
have any reference points to politics, don't think their voice counts, don't think learning about their community will help them in any way. They tend to be people who think their self-efficacy is, is relatively low, that their voices don't matter. In the United States, depending on how you measure it, about half of adults would fall into what I would call empty chambers. They are not necessarily talking about politics or thinking that it's relevant to their life, even in the most fundamental, sort of in my neighborhood uh, kind of spaces. So when Professor Sasson was talking about um, hacking the neighborhood and open sourcing the neighborhood, that is, that is a, probably a gateway for lots of these people actually to be thinking, this stuff can make a difference in my life uh, and help me. Obviously, it's participatory, uh, social, and spreadable. I'm just lifting Dana Boyd's categories there. It, it, it changes the character of information when it has those traits. It's linked and scaled. Uh, a new thing, particularly uh, for uh, digital communities, is it's perpetually edited. You know, in the good old industrial media days, this, when you hit the publish button or when you you know launch the newscast, that was pretty much the end of the story. Sure, there'd be angry letters to the editor if you screwed something up, or maybe you'd have pickets outside your door if you didn't tell their part of the story. But it was a really modest part, if not minor part, of the reality of the life of chroniclers of their communities. Now, it's happening all the time. I don't know any journalist in any part of the world who doesn't compose stories thinking about the audience that he or she knows will be reacting to that information. So there's this vivid sense that the audience is right there with me. They're going to skewer me if I screw things up. They're going to challenge me if I leave things out. They're going to wonder why their point of view wasn't reflected in my story. And it's uh, and plus, I got to file about 50 versions of the story: one for the website, one for the app, one for the uh, you know the evening newscast, one for the refresh at midnight, things like that. So there's a there's a sense that the, the stories never end. That there's there, there's sort of ongoing conversations. Context is fluid and collapsed. Again, I'm sort of lifting Dana Boyd's ideas here that, you know, I'm here looking at you and I have a sense of whether you're paying attention or not. You have a sense of whether I'm articulating myself well or not. That's the context of our conversation, right? But if somebody's going to watch the video of this speech later on, alone, solitary, sitting at her computer or, you know, with an app, she might have a really different understanding of what I said. And if one of you sort of hacks my talk and and, and pick snippets of it that are not particularly flattering to me or that make me look awesome or whatever, you know, that's a different context too. And everybody who's tweeting this talk to your followers, they're having a different sense of this. So there's all these multiple contexts now that we have to be juggling and thinking about and we can never really account for the weird ways a lot of the stuff that we say and do will be reinterpreted by the world. It's timeless and searchable, and it's given meaning by uh, networks and algorithms in an interesting way now. Um, as I say, we, meaning making occurs in networks and when machines help us do this stuff. So that's sort of the um, technology part of the story. Why don't I pause again to see if everybody's doing okay. Okay, okay. So uh, there are lots of ways that, that this new environment affects uh, networks and individuals. Uh, three of them, I think, are particularly relevant for those who are thinking about uh, digital cultures. The first is information is a third skin. This is a wonderful French notion. Your first skin is your skin skin. Your second skin is your clothes. Data now are the third skin. When you can access it all the time instantaneously, real-time information, just-in-time queries being answered, it changes people's expectations about what they can know and what they can do. It changes their experience of others. And it changes the way that they actually have to remember things. I mean, literally, there's an argument that it changes the way that people think now when they can be sort of a uh, paleontologist of their memory by going to the cloud and just remember things that they couldn't before. Okay, so that's, another, that's one part of it. The second thing is that as it expands the social horizons of people, um, those tight-knit communities used to give people their identity by your family name, by the village you were from, and by the, the craft that you practiced in the way that you uh, made your living. So those birth realities are still vividly part of people's lives, but now they are added to them sort of multiple, as, much, as many as you want, um, uh, tribal realities. Whatever you're interested in, you can find and form a community uh, online to balance your interests. And so there are places now, I mean, would, would, one of the places where this really shows up in, um, in our data is the rare disease communities. You know, in the industrial age, if you had a, if you or your child had a rare disease, you were not in very much luck to, to find people who could tell you what, what had happened, what doctors to go to, what hospitals did it well, what medicines to take, what uh, side effects of those medicines might be. 
Now, on the fly, you can find those communities and, and meet thousands of people in the place where you really care. So these just-in-time, just-like-me communities are a very vivid part of people's experience of community and community and network construction in this age. Uh, it's just a, you know, it's a, it's a brand new human reality. And then, um, you've probably seen this notion because my colleague at the, formerly of the Oxford Internet Institute, Bill Dutton, I wish I had been smart enough to think of this, but he coined this wonderful notion that, the, that social media practitioners live in the fifth estate. In your French history, you remember the three estates were the clergy, the nobility, and the peasants. In the, in the English-speaking West, the, the notion of a fourth estate came into civic life at the turn of the 20th century as journalists had a very different perspective on civic information and, and where news fit into communities. Uh, so the fourth estate, uh, just symbolized by the press and reporters, that became um, a, a strong notion. Bill looked at his data, same as my data, he's smart enough to see it, I, I'm now ripping off his idea. He says, social media practitioners live in yet again a different space uh, in the media ecosystem. They are not arm's length, dispassionate chroniclers of what's going on in their community. They don't feel duty bound by any norm to tell multiple sides of the story. They don't feel any obligation to keep their emotions in check when they're talking about stuff. They're all in. The reason that they're sharing information is they really care about something. They really want people to understand what it's about. If it's about anything related to politics, they want people to convert to their side of the story. So that it's passionate, it's personal, it's personalized, and it's, uh, and it's, it's given a very unique, uh, singular perspective when it's put out in the world. So this is changing the way that people talk about civic and political and, and policy activities in the world. And it's, it's just a way, it's afforded by um, all of these technologies. So I thought I'd tell you three quick stories that give you uh, a little backdrop to my notion that networking is unstoppable. Um, uh, and so, here I, here I go. One of them is, is sort of highlights um, how these technologies in this new environment empowers individuals to make the case for themselves. Another is, is the Chinese story about mobilizing resources and really changing the nature of at least some of, of, uh, of you know, governmental and political culture. And then the third is do-it-yourself problem solving. So the uh, empowered individual story is, is about this little guy. Uh, a year ago, um, he, he's, a, he's a, in the United States, his name is Josh Hardy, and he's been sick since the beginning of his life. He's had four uh, bouts of kidney cancer. He, at, that, at this point, he was seven years old, and he had another uh, cancer relapse, was given antiviral drugs, but this time, for the first time, the drugs that he was given um, almost destroyed his kidneys, and he was hospitalized in dire condition and the doctors at the hospital where he was told his mother that there was an experimental antiviral drug seen not to cause the same side effects that the existing antiviral drug he took had caused for him. So the, 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 the drug is called, I'm going to read it here because I can't pronounce it without a sign here, Rincidofavir. It's actually the same drug that was experimentally used on the Ebola patients who were brought back to Western cultures from uh, Western Africa uh, with Ebola cases. So it's out there, it's, it's in its third clinical trial, so from the regulatory perspective, it's close to being approved as a drug, but it's not officially approved, and it isn't specifically approved for doing this kind of work to help people with their, um, with their um, you know, viral reactions to, to, uh, to these kidney drugs. So his mom does what any mother do would do, uh, she, she wrote an email, actually, to her friends and said, I, I need this company named uh, Kimerix with this drug to, to make some doses available to my son, otherwise he's going to die. And somebody in her email chain, this is just classic networking, somebody in her email chain uh, knew about the company and, and the firm and set up a Facebook page called Save Josh and began to promote the cause. Well, somebody who read that Facebook page also happened to know that the CEO of that company had written an email to a bunch of people, and now including to Josh and his family, saying they couldn't release the drugs. And the text of the email basically said, um, we're, we're at the final stages of clinical trials. 
And we need to complete the clinical trial so the most people can avail themselves of this drug. If we divert doses and we divert our attention from this drug, uh, from, the, from the completion of these trials, uh, more people are going to be hurt. But he, he also said uh, we, can't, you know, we can't spare the expense of doing it. So that incensed the people who were running the site for Josh. Uh, they also created a Tumblr page that was beginning to document what was going on. And of course, once the, the community saw this, the CEO's reaction, they began to uh, give the CEO and the company brief. They basically said, you know, why are you denying a dying boy the chance to live? And the company, began, in a matter of days, began to see headlines like this. Thousands pay company to get medication to sick boy. So here's a company that four days before was in final stages of a drug that the government thought was good enough to give Ebola patients. It was likely to, you know, doing well enough so that it's, it's pretty likely to be approved for stuff. And is, and is sort of playing by all the rules of the game for, for drug authorization. All of a sudden, it gets um, you know, challenged by an event like this. And then, in part because in America, uh, the conservative community is pretty angry at drug regulators in our country. There is partly a free market thing, don't get in our way as we produce things for the drugs. It's partly because the, they, they don't think the process is fast enough or effective enough in putting new drugs on the market. Interestingly enough, this isn't just a conservative issue, but they've really taken it up as a cause in the past couple of years. So the, the sort of the, the bulletin board for the conservative community in America is Fox TV. And on a segment in the morning on Fox TV, they not only had the mother in tears talking about her son being on his deathbed, but the commentators then took off and sort of challenged the morals and the um, you know, the, the capacity of the company to make the decisions uh, that it was making. There's another whole sort of parallel universe of conservative organizations that then took off the cause. One of them is called Free Republic. If you've ever, maybe that you've heard the expression being freaked, F-R-E-E-P-E-D. Freaked is when, the, when this community calls to action all of the folks that they want to, um, you know, promote a cause for them or to challenge something that's going on. So this company got freaked. And so they're inundated with press coverage, with social media challenges, with an angry conservative constituency. Um, and on top of that, there is an organization called Max Cure. And it builds its own media uh, list of, of, of people to, to, who will tweet on command about things. And the company immediately raised $50,000 to pay for whatever costs the company might incur for giving the drugs to little Josh. So the company's position is totally untenable at that point, and they relent and give the boy uh, the drugs, and within three days, he's in recovery, and he's doing pretty well today. Um, and that was celebrated uh, by the media community, and in ways so that this sort of perpetuated itself that way. And it spawned a, a, a sort of broader drive uh, in a variety of states and at the federal level to change the mechanisms by which experimental drugs were available, especially to terminally ill children. So this is one, you know, one family situation that they, you know, networked individual, you know, you exploited her network to get an outcome now that's going to potentially change the drug review process that exists uh, in the United States. Um, so, so the lessons that I, you know, think are pretty obvious from this. Um, Example: Social media are deeply embedded in the media ecosystem. There was, in, in many cases, it was not a separate domain apart from the mainstream media. What's so intriguing now, especially in the United States, is these are braided, fully integrated media systems. The mainstream media watch what's happening in social media to get story ideas, to validate stories, to promote ideas. So that a lot of times you see reporters now saying, "I need someone." or some organization to give me information about or tell me stories about, fill in the blank kind of story, and they recruit sources uh, through that system. So social media are now, it was such an interesting argument 10 years ago in the United States, it was amateurs and pros, and, they, and, and the amateur bloggers and eventually social media users had no place in newsrooms. 
and it had no place driving any any sort of media acceptance of what of, of, or media narratives about what was going on in the culture, that argument ended long ago. And there's this very symbiotic relationship between social media and regular media. Um, this is a way that you know, very personal issues under the right circumstances can burst forth with a nerving speed that took down the company. Um, and in many respects, there was a really interesting follow-up conversation on this about how a particularly effective networked individual essentially could jump the line for treatment for these drugs. This is not necessarily a clean, uniform story of good versus bad, right people, you know, making their case to people who had wrong ideas. There, was, there are whole systems now that are being challenged by the capacity of people with the right tools and literacies and right allies to jump the system. So there's a whole bioethics debate now that's uh, swirling around this. I'm going to run through my other... Actually, let me stop. Let's answer questions just to make sure I get everything doing. I'll tell you two more stories if you want, but it's kind of like that. No? Okay, keep going. Um, so here I took an example, and I hope Professor Gould will correct me if I'm, um, I'm just way off on this, but it's just watching this from afar, it was so interesting to observe the growth of the environmental movement uh, in China. Deng Fei is a well-known um, uh, journalist activist, a critic of the government and stuff. He's done a whole bunch of campaigns, one of which was to, to help get, raise money so children would have good food in, in parts of, of China. But he, last year, uh, or I guess in 2013, as people were going home for the Lunar New Year, as they were leaving cities to go back to their villages to you know, be with their families uh, for the holidays, he, on, uh, to his four million Weibo followers, he said, how is the river in your hometown? Well, you're home for the holidays. Take a photo of the river stream in your hometown and upload it to, to Weibo for us to see. And lo and behold, people went home and thousands upon thousands of pictures started pouring in of people saying, actually, the rivers are horrible in my hometown. I hadn't noticed so much before. There's always been sort of a litter issue uh, with rivers and streams in China. But the much bigger concern that now uh, this community was beginning <coughs> to surface was that there was pollution occurring from the, in the groundwater, that toxins were being pumped below ground into aquifers, and that um, you know there are communities where lots of people were getting sick in unexplained ways. And so not only were these pictures sort of powerful enough, and they got picked up by the official Chinese media, that was one of the iconic pictures. That's, a, that's supposed to be a, a river, uh, if you can believe it. But all, the government, in part in response to this, began to sort of worry about the groundwater, and they published an amazing report uh, later in the year about cancer villages. And, you know, there are thousands of them where they're just unexplained cancer clusters of people who are, you know, obviously suffering in some way from pollution levels uh, in their community. And but the, the fact that this environmentalism was now taking place in so, many, uh, in so many places in so many ways, there's a really interesting network developing of the NGOs and the government practitioners and people who are individual actors like, um, like him to... Uh, to promote the cause. And then, of course, it spilled over into other things. It just led to more, uh, more activists calling for more people to call out uh, this is sort of the anti-corruption campaign, where uh, a journalist recently asked folks to photograph cars of members of the People's Liberation Army that just sort of were out of line with their salary levels. This is a Maserati that somebody uh, was, from the People's Liberation the Army was, was uh, driving. And so these sort of crowdsource campaigns matter. So again, sort of taking away from this, local issues can be turned into national campaigns, especially around Manuel Castell's idea of networks of outrage. They, they, there are now so many ways that social media structures are really um, mass media structures. And under the right circumstances, you can marshal a small army of, of people paying attention to you, but also acting on, your, on the things that you want them to do. Um, and the people themselves want to be asked. I mean, under normal circumstances, it's a, they wouldn't necessarily think what to do, but if someone asks them in the right way under the right circumstances, they're happy to snap a picture, make a contribution, uh, give a little uh, snippet of information, and maybe that leads to something uh, bigger. And obviously, if enough people do this in enough ways, um, there is just too much pressure on the government to be more transparent about what's going on and get to the bottom of things. 
So the final story I'm just going to tell you real quickly uh, came from the way that American communities responded to a massive hurricane in the year 2013. Um, there were lots of people who used social media to talk about what was going on. There was an interesting way, I mean, one of the most interesting parts of crowdsourcing now is that people uh, feel compelled to challenge bad information as it's being promoted in the time of crisis. So this was a Photoshop picture uh, allegedly showing the storm over the famous New York City Statue of Liberty that within about three minutes of that picture being posted, people were immediately saying, you know what, that's a Photoshopped event, that, that's a scene from a recent movie about the apocalypse com coming like this, this is not what's happening in New York, stop uh, paying attention to this, so there's sort of self-corrective mechanisms. But then the most interesting thing was that people in local neighborhoods began to create their own media structures. They used local Facebook pages, uh, other resources, to begin to say, what's happening on my block? And the, the value of this to, to citizens was that they could never get that level of detail about their home and their communities uh, from mass media. There just wasn't any possible way the traditional sources of media would get down to that level of personal uh, address of the, of the concerns in my mind. And then now this has led to a really interesting um, sort of either crowdsourced or even um, uh, for-profit model of, of creating these matching services. When communities have needs, people want to volunteer for those things, there are ways now that, that there are platforms being developed to match up people who have expressed their needs. So again, um, self-organizing groups can complement government services. There are, no, there are ways in which they replace government services or they perform better than government agencies do, but in most cases they're complementing. They're doing things that government agencies aren't necessarily constituted to do. Uh, neighborhood level insights are, are often much more powerful and meaningful to people than uh, sort of broad scale community insights that often come from mass media. And doggone it, I'm just going to say it, uh, that after all of our worries about whether people are getting nastier to each other and doing more miserable things together, there's still a part of human nature that wants to help and that wants to be a contributor to these things. And these technologies sometimes have the magic way of pulling that out to people. So networking is unstoppable because people always will have problems that they want to solve and now they have new tools to solve them. And that will be my final word. Thank you very much.